So this, this week on uh, the question and answer session, I'm delighted to say that Quentin Letts has joined us for a bit of chat today. So good morning, Quentin. How are you? Uh, good morning. I've joined you late and apologies for that. That's all right. It's no problem. Um, I was thinking that you're, um, I was looking at your uh, biography and, and you are um, a man of many talents. I was wondering what it says um, on your passport for occupation. What, what would you describe your occupation as? <laughs> I don't think they actually ask that anymore, but I suppose just journo or writer, perhaps. Okay. But nothing more grand than that. Yeah. And, and where did that kind of love of uh, journalism and writing begin? Was it, was it right back at school or, or was it something that came later in life? Uh, yes, from school days, I was interested really only in becoming a, um, in getting into newspapers. And uh, I don't know where it comes from in terms of um, parental guidance or anything like that. My father was a schoolmaster and my mother was a, a school matron. So uh, neither of them was... My, my father had a very low opinion of journalists. Okay. And he would say to his boys, his pupils, if he saw them with their, their, their shirt collars undone, he'd say to them, you look, he said, you look like a third-rate American journalist. And that was the lowest insult in his book. Okay. Where did you, uh, so what were you reading as a boy that got you interested into journalism? You know, was it, was it just uh, novels or were you actually reading newspapers as a young boy or? Yes, I read a lot of newspapers. We, um, we took, because it was a school where I lived, my parents ran a school. There were, it was the Daily Telegraph and the Times every day and the Daily Mail. And my mom, my grandmother took the Sunday Express. I used to love the Sunday Express. But mm. I also read uh, a lot of, I was devoted to Desmond Bagley, the thriller writer, um, mm. as a boy. And also history novels by Rosemary Sutcliffe and R.J. Unstead. So uh, pretty uncomplicated tastes. Um, uh, and um, I suppose I just got caught up with the, what's fun about journalism is um, that you, every day is different and you're dealing with people the whole time. And um, I could never have done anything that was devoted to uh, detail of figures or um, intellectual rigour. Being a journalist is much more my sort of bag. Yeah. Well, when I was a boy, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I used to love reading the newspapers, the Red Tops, to be fair. Um, but I used to love reading about the sport. And I'd read every article and yeah. um, every single Cricket. football result and everything like that. And, and, and kids don't really have that now, do they? They don't. And what, what, it's really sad that they don't have the physical newspaper because it was so satisfying to turn the paper and you'd actually get much more. You'd, you'd come across surprises in, with the physical newspaper in a way that online people don't. People online are much more uh, in silos. They go to what they know they like. That's and right. there's much less of the accident. There's much less happenstance in modern newspaper consumption. And also the great thing, I think, in in, in um, the 1960s and 70s with the cricket reports or the football reports mm. where you get match reports rather than nowadays yeah. sports pages are just about columnists sounding off mm. um, but a, a really skillful match report was a beautiful thing to read yeah, I, and there were cricket writers it. in the times who could make a, a match report sing yeah what you just said there just um, made me think about maybe the demise of local regional newspapers as well. Uh, in, in our town, the Burnley Express was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, everybody in the town would buy it and would read yeah. up, often finding out somebody who's passed away and be surprised or a bit of news. Uh, but that demise has been quite dramatic. And, and when, I go, when you go in the garage where the papers are now, the, the local paper, you know, there's probably 30 copies there. That's, that's probably all yeah. they need. Well, I live in, in near uh, Ross and Wye, and the Ross Gazette is still going, but it's a pretty slender publication. Yeah. Uh, and when I was a lad, the, uh, we lived in Sirencester in Gloucestershire, and the Wilts and Gloss Standard was the big paper. And uh, I used to occasionally get a letter. I'd write a letter. I'd re often writing letters to the paper, uh, like a lunatic. And, uh, and I would feel so pleased with myself and walk very tall for that week that the, um, the, the paper had my letter. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I did similar, but not to the to perhaps the same levels that you reached. But uh, now I just wanted to uh, touch on uh, theatre a little bit. Um, I, I love going to the theatre. One of my favourite theatres is the Grand Theatre in Blackpool. I was wondering if it's a theatre that you visited in your career at any point? I have done in the past. Uh, yeah. I went there once 
uh, during a party conference and I think I saw something fairly mainstream let's say yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's a really beautiful theatre and, uh, and you know uh, they're very concerned about the future I was uh, I was wondering what what your thoughts were about theatre at the moment and obviously um, you know the fact that people just can't go and, and it's really worrying isn't it uh, what are your thoughts about that at the moment Quentin? I feel flattened I feel desolate I feel slightly denuded as a person not being able to go to theatre. I love going to theatre. But I also feel desperately sorry for the people who work in theatre and people who it is their vocation. And I've been very admiring in the last few months of Andrew Lloyd Webber and his attempts to try to get theatre back and to overcome some of the uh, officialdom has been really unhelpful, I'm afraid. Public Health England has been very unhelpful because theatre is more than just stories on a stage it, it creates that sense of community that you were talking about with the newspaper a bit and it also gives people an, an artistic hour or so when they can escape the um, chaos of, of modern life and that's really important at the moment i think one of my big bugbears at the moment is that we aren't having enough out time we're not having enough time to escape the worries about coronavirus and I, I feel very strongly that the theatre should be doing that, the music should be doing that, and also I think the church should be doing it. I think the church has been a terrible failure, in, in, in failure of service to allow people to escape modern day and to jump into something more thoughtful and to relax into contemplation. Yeah, just expand on that a little bit, Quentin. I was going to get onto that, but, but um, in, can you just expand on what you said there about the, the church? Well, I think it's, it's funny, I mean, theatre is not normal. But there's a desperate need among people at the moment, I think, for normality and to um, escape the hassles. We've all, we're all wor so worried the whole time yeah. about our children, about our income, about our society. And if you can just for a while get away from that, I think it's terribly good for your morale. For your, people talk about now about mental health, but I think morale is probably a, a less um, difficult way of talking about it. And uh, theatre does that in the most beautiful way because it creates an imaginary world where actually you can see, despite it being an imaginary world, it can give you very good lessons in the real world. And you can experience characters who are going through torment. Yeah. Characters in plays are normally going through a hard time, otherwise they wouldn't be a story. And you, you can look at that and you can think, blimey, maybe my own life isn't quite so bad after all. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I miss, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't, I like regional theatre, I like any, any live performance and I really, it's one of the things that I am really missing and uh, yeah. I, the first Actually, Alex, also, also what it does, I think, it does to me anyway, because in my normal life, I'm rather a buttoned up Englishman. <laughs> but when I go to the theatre, sitting in the dark, watching characters play yeah. out an emotive story, yeah. I find my waterworks spring the most terrible leaks. Yeah. And having a good cry is actually very important. And I went to a musical the other day in a not very promising venue up in Wembley, um, which used to be a former TV studio. It wasn't the most beautiful theatre, not like uh, Blackpool's theatre. And uh, even though that was a rather unpromising venue, watching the musical on stage, which they did terrifically well, um, uh, it, it, it made you it made one very very it, it purged one because I was you know you were crying at the moments of tenderness or the moments of sadness yeah. on stage yeah. and that is a very important thing the Greeks understood that the purging quality of tragedy is, yeah. is tremendously powerful and I, I enjoy that when you, you when you least expect it I remember uh, my daughters took me to well I was almost dragged along to see Hairspray the musical in Manchester and uh, so this is just not going to be my cup of tea at all. But uh, I did. I was like you said at the end. I was in tears. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> well, this show I saw the other day was called Sleepless. It's based on Sleepless in Seattle, which yeah. is you know it's quite a corny story, yeah. but it worked. And yeah. theatre does that. It gives you a good old rinsing, an emotional rinsing, a, 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 a rinsing of your morale, and that's that's what we need at the moment. Yeah. I just want to keep on this theme a little bit, if you like, if it's all right, Quentin. I, I was brought up on uh, end of the pier theatre, so summer seasons uh, in Bournemouth and, uh, and Blackpool and Brighton and, and, and 
the, the, did you ever go to Great Yarmouth? I, I did go to Great Yarmouth. The Hippodrome. I, I can actually remember, yeah, I went to see, uh, this is when he was popular, I saw Jim Davidson uh, in, in the, I think he owned, I think he owned the theatre there, didn't he? Did he buy the theatre? Not the Hippodrome, he may have owned the one on the pier. But uh, Yeah, he bought, yeah anyway, but uh, yeah, and, and I love that. And, and I was, when I was looking at your biography, you touched on that you went to uh, um, university, but one of the highlights was being in the panto. And yeah. I, I think um, some people kind of take panto not very seriously because it isn't very serious, but it's got its place, hasn't it? Oh, it does. Pantomime's fantastic, not just because it's popular and therefore draws a big crowd and has a big feel to it, but it's, uh, it's very on the button. It's very topical. The, the jokes are funny because they, are, they pull in jokes from, from the year. Mm. And also it's, it takes us back because of the stories being complete nonsensical fairy tales. It takes you back to your own childhood and it somehow roots you, I think. It's a good guy wrote pantomime. Yeah, and, and you uh, you played a part at university. What can you remember? What part you played there? Oh, we we used to do one every year. Yeah, and um, my under in my undergraduate years at Trinity College Dublin, they were pretty they were pretty ropey shows. Uh, but then when I got, I did a year's postgrad at Cambridge, and the Footlights at the Arts Theatre in Cambridge was quite a it was mm. quite a, a decent production. And I think I was the narrator at the start, and then I was one of the dancers. <laughs> One of the clung in sort of four hooves, yeah. four heavy hooves. I'm a terrible dancer, but it was I was just I was the narrator at the start and at the start of the second half as well. Sort of, yeah, sort of master of ceremonies. I was a huge fan of Rick Mail. I always thought he'd be wonderful in pantomime because he was just so anarchic. I would yeah, love yeah. to see him play Widow Twenty or something. And also Nigel Havers is very good in pantomime actually, ah. because it, you, you don't expect it because he's so suave, but then he he camps it up tremendously and uh, makes jokes against himself. Panto makes jokes against ourselves. Yeah. It's quite good. We need to do that. That's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, just um, also another thing that, that struck me is you're, you're, you're quite well travelled, aren't you? You, you? you went to Kentucky in America. How, how did you end up there? What, what took you to America? Uh, well, I went to America in, uh, as a 17-year-old boy in 1980 uh, because I had left school by my A-levels and I was still too young to go to university in England. So I went to a college in Kentucky on a, uh, an exchange program. And um, I had a year there and it was fantastic. It was a really interesting year. Um, I got there, everyone in England said to me, there's no way that fool Ronald Reagan's gonna win the election. Uh, Jimmy Carter's a shoe in I got there, immediately it was apparent that um, the Europeans were wrong about that. Uh, it was a big year, it was the year that the Pope got shot Right. Um, John Lennon was killed. Uh, there was a there was a, there was a, a lot about the space shuttle. I can't remember. I think there was a space shuttle um, was took off for the first time, and uh, there was also the Iran hostage crisis. It was a big year for. It seemed a big year for news. Perhaps every yeah. year is a big new, year for news. But when you're 17, you notice these things, and it was a real eye opener to me about the enormity of America, and about the smallness of. England and uh, yeah. certainly of um, my my life in England, so it was it was tremendous, and I, I drank buckets of um, <laughs> of bourbon as well <laughs> illegally. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it what you expected? Was it a you know you said earlier you know how English you were at heart? Was it mind blowing in that regard? Or it was a tr tremendous culture shock. Um, it was much less elevated in terms of manners and intellect than I was expecting from a college. Um, it was much more authentic uh, and bits of it were just like the Dukes of Hazard. Um, so it was, you know, it was, it was not life in middle-class Sirencester. <laughs> I, I just got, I just got <laughs> an image of you with, uh, was it Roscoe Pico trade there? <laughs> I mean, Boss Hogg and all that. And, you know, there were, there, some of the some of the kids at the university did wear um, dungarees like they did in, uh, in the Duke of Hazard, and the girls were tremendously pretty and all, all sort of um, cowboy hats and cowboy boots. And the uh, people were driving around in pickup trucks and chewing tobacco. It was it was a big big difference from my 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 life. Yeah, and then later you went to New York. Is that right? I did a couple of stints in New York as a reporter. Um, yeah. 
uh, yes, I was, I was in New York briefly for the uh, Daily Telegraph. It was at the time of the Gulf War and uh, a lot of their foreign reporters had been sent to the Gulf War. So I was dispatched to America to hold, hold New York for a bit. And um, I got to do a, a tour of the States with the Queen, uh, part, part, reporting on the Queen doing her American tour that year, about 1990, uh, I think. And um, golly, I was, I was lucky. I mean, I was a young lad, young reporter, and um, was thrown right into a tremendous story like yeah. that. And then yeah. went back later in mid-90s and did a couple of years for The Times in New York. I, I've never visited New York, but I, I really would love to. Is it a place you hold uh, fondly in your heart? or Not madly, no, actually. No. Um, uh, it's a city of right angles. Uh, architecturally and, and uh, it's set out on a grid system and there's something very although it's got this wild reputation I found certainly on my second trip there that New York had become very um, uh, caught up in it sort of um, imprisoned by um, procedure and political correctness mm. and I found it rather a uh, rather a predictable place in some ways. And the only thing that kept me sane, if anything kept me sane, um, but it, the thing that kept me sane was the company, uh, I was working in an office with Australians and the Aussies were tremendous. Mm. And um, they were uh, a good outlet for frustration because New York itself, you have to be very, you have to behave in a certain way. I, I find it, and also it's actually not a terribly spiritual city. No, because perhaps of the of the architecture again. Yeah. Did you did you seek out any of the churches in New York or even? Yeah, I used to go to uh, I think it's St George's on Fifth Avenue, which very, um, it's the sort of, it's basically the Protestant cathedral, but it's not a cathedral. Um, yeah. Cathedral is a um, St Patrick's is a Roman Catholic one, uh, but the St Thomas's was basically Book of Common Prayer or a version of with um, wonderful music. So that's where I used to go there. But New York. I prefer the states, of, uh, the middle of the states, the, the Midwest. And my favorite state uh, was Montana, right. the big sky. And you get there, you get a tremendous sense of freedom. On, on the, the East Coast, people don't feel so free because they're very constrained by um, political correctness. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to really ask the typical, just boring questions, but, uh, you know, do you think, do you think um, Trump is going to win or do you think he's going to get hoofed out this time round? Well, I, f I feel a bit like one of those people in 1980 who used to say, uh, well, there's no chance that that fool Reagan's going to get in. Um, and I suspect I may be wrong. I, th I think Trump might win. Yes. Uh, I was, I mean, I, I can only, I haven't been to the States for a few years. Um, why, why do you think he might, why, why do you think he can still win even though he gets an absolute booting in the media and, what, what, and the polls suggest otherwise, don't they? The opinion polls suggest otherwise. I suspect there's a very much a, um, a sort of blind vote uh, in, in, the, in the opinion polls. I should think that people are not owning up to being Trump supporters because the, the, the mood in the media is so anti-Trump. I, su I suspect people feel we mustn't possibly confess to being Trump supporters. So there'll be a sort of a hidden Trump vote of perhaps 10%, I suspect. And yeah. the other thing is I suspect that the... I mean, these are just pure surmises on my behalf, but possibly the um, American economy has been going fairly well and seems to be lifting a bit again now. And the Black Lives Matter stuff has probably helped Trump, I suspect, because it's created such um, a, a, a sort of um, a didacticism of liberalism that I think people will feel they want to shrug that off. Yeah. And, and just um, just trying to be a little bit topical. I was, I was interested by Les Ferdinand's uh, comments about Black Lives Matters and thinks that maybe it's a time for it to come to an end. What, what's your take on that, Quentin? Yeah, I thought he was, he was quite brave doing that and saying that. It was about Queen's Park Rangers, wasn't it? That's right. Um, um, I, I'd agree with him. I think if you're going to, if you want to express your view about Black Lives Matter, which, or, but let's take, let's not call it Black Lives Matter because that's an organization with certain baggage. Yeah. And if you want to express your view about um, minority rights in some way, I think it's better to do it as an individual rather than doing it as part of some big uh, bondoogle, which has got all sorts of other political baggage. I don't yeah. think it helps the cause to get caught up in the election of the day or else in other programs that that organization might pursue it's better to just do it nobly as yourself yeah 
Yeah, being told you. you've got to bend the knee seems to me not not great because you're 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 wagging your finger and you're telling people what they must do. Well, that's yes. that's a form of slavery. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Quentin. Um, just um, well, we've talked about Trump and we've talked about Black Lives Matter. We might, we might as well briefly talk about uh, Boris and the situation right now. Um, so it's I was we were watching telly with the kids last night and we were talking about. Crikey, this time last year we were preparing for, well, we were talking, it was all Brexit, wasn't it? It was Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. It was. Yeah. And I don't even think we knew at this point that there was going to be a general election. It was a bit later, wasn't it? Um, I think we were about to get Lady Hale, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> she was about to make her, she and her spider were yeah. about to make their entrance into public life. Um, gosh, it feels, it feels another age, doesn't it? Yeah. And... Um, I think the question I want to ask you is, is that, uh, to me, just uh, watching, uh, the Tories are getting a bit of a kick in at the moment. Um, but, I, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, that kind of blind vote for Boris. I, I kind of get the feeling there's still people rooting for Boris to kind of solve this um, and and bring everything, <laughs> everything better. But do you think that is, am I misreading those signs or, or do you think that's that's true? In my personal uh, experience, the people who've given up on Boris are the people on the right. Um, and the, I mean, there's, there's always been a big, a big chunk of people. Let's admit, uh, let's be honest about this, on the left who, who can't abide him. Uh, and people on the centre left who particularly get very, very cross about him because of Brexit. But the people in recent weeks who've given up on him are the Brexiteer wing, the sort of the libertarians the people who don't like being told to wear masks. I'm one of them, I must confess. And the people who feel that the damage being done to the economy is now not worth the price of, of saving lives, COVID lives. So that, that's where I think he's leached. That, that's where he's, he's lost support. I think he has gained a bit of, he's solidified support in the center ground. And I think that's where he's steering. He's trying to show that he is not Boris, the irresponsible Brexiteer, He's trying to show that he is Boris, the big nation, uh, levelling up um, uh, prime minister. And that, that I mean, that uh, if there is a strategy, I'm not convinced that there is a strategy, by the way. But uh, 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 if there is one, that strikes me, it, it must be that, in that he's trying to, to keep in the middle ground and to stop Keir Starmer uh, getting any sort of wiggle room in the middle. Do you think he's a... Do you think he's a... Do you think he's a genius or do you think he's a bit mad or a combination of the both or neither? Uh, I think all prime ministers um, are a bit mad. I think all politicians are a bit, bit unusual, certainly. Is he a genius? I think there, there are aspects of um, rare, rare sparkle to him, but he seems to have lost that sparkle to me at the moment. Um, uh, and he's being, I mean, I wish he weren't being quite so responsible. Uh, in in the, the orthodox way, I, I wish he were worrying more about the economy and about um, saving people's lives uh, in, in other ways, and in sort of getting the health service back, in work looking after people with cancer, for instance. But yeah. that's 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 a sort of personal worry about mine. But um, I, I think he's lost a bit of his brio, uh, but or at least he had done about a week ago. There were signs of it yesterday. Prime Minister's questions that he is. He's on pretty fair form at the moment, personally, but you, tr you, you don't want to think about the sort of pressure he's under. No, and I, I don't, you, you know, you, I don't think they get much support domestically. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Quentin. Just to kind of, um, just to mindful of time, I'd just like to talk a little bit about church, uh, if that's all right. Uh, and um, I noticed that you are um, an admirer of uh, Anglican hymns in particular. Um, I am. I'm married to an organist. I believe so, yeah. And, and is it right you were a church warden or are you still a church warden? Or? Well, I was a deputy church warden. I wasn't a push it, but I was sort of, um, I was uh, uh, leaned on as a sort of dog's body and they called me the deputy church warden. But I stormed out in disgust um, over the church's response to COVID. Well, stormed out in disgust has put it too strongly. But I felt that I couldn't go on honestly, being a member of the PCC, our local parochial church council, because the church's response to COVID struck me as very, very wanting. 
I wanted the church to supply some of that normality I was talking about earlier, yeah. to provide a uh, a guy rope, to be to be a, an area where people could continue to find some peace and quiet. Instead, what happened was, well, the churches were shut completely, which struck me as monstrous. Mm. Uh, and second, when, when the, the tiny bit of reopening happened, the reopening was so limited and so people were being bossed around so much that it prevented any sort of meaningful contemplation happening in the church. If you went to the church, you were told you had to sit in one particular place, you couldn't look at a hymn book, you couldn't light a candle, you couldn't approach the altar, and everything was roped off with a sort of tape that the police use when there's been a car crash. Yeah. And that, to me, was a, a te- it was a terrible rape of the privacy and peace and quiet that people need in a church, or certainly some of us need in a church. Yeah. Now, uh, Justin Welby makes the perfectly good argument that church is everywhere, you, church doesn't just happen in the building, and that um, it can happen as easily in his kitchen. And he duly did his Easter service from the kitchen at Lambeth Palace. Well... That was that's okay for some people, but for people like me who struggle to believe and who are you know we we, we want to believe and we we do believe sometimes, but we have a slightly shaky faith, we need all the props we can get, and for the props by props i don't mean kitchen kettles i don't mean the bishop's coffee maker, I want to have cold stone that's been there from medieval days i want I, it really helps me to have a flickering candle flame it helps me to have the smell of the church and to have the aura of sanctity. Yeah. And if you, go, if you went to a church and you were surrounded by all this botheration of, Brex, of, 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 of COVID, then it really got in the way. And therefore I felt, I felt really assaulted by the church's response to this and terribly disappointed. And I still feel a little, I, st- I, st- I feel called out and mm. rather empty as, at the moment because we're not being able to go to church normally. Yeah. Well, that is it. That is incredibly honest. I would, wouldn't expect anything less from a, from a journalist. I was, uh, I was verbally assaulted in Burnley uh, when the churches were closed. Uh, I had no say in the matter. It was a decision that was taken. And it really made me think about what you've just described, you know, that, that need for the building. And I can't lie to you, Quentin. My mantra has been, while the church was closed well we need to be creative and we need to do other things and we did but I do absolutely understand your view that you know the church um, is essential um, and the church is outside but for many people and for particularly for people who come to church weekly it is it is absolutely I've realized since we've reopened how important it is for people and maybe I should have realized that sooner but um since well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had that, Alex. I'm sorry you had that. People are doing that to you, but in a way, it's a compliment because it shows that it does matter to people, yeah. and it's very important for the collar to be seen and for you to get out in the community. And I just worry. I mean, I don't want to make this about Justin Welby, but I, I, I worry he hasn't been. He, he, he disappeared for a bit, and I would have wanted the Archbishop to be out in front of the gates, in front of the locked door of yeah. Canterbury Cathedral, beating his breast and saying, I feel your pain a bit more. But, you know, uh, it's, it's mean to attack the Archbishop. Yeah. And this is more about, perhaps it's more telling us, the, you know, about ourselves and showing us perhaps, perhaps if there's any good that comes out of this, it shows us the hole that there has been in our lives with the church being shut and maybe we can get back and rediscover it in a more enthusiastic way. Yeah. How do you, how do you assess the future for the Anglican Church? Particularly in, <laughs> particularly in England. And oh, be, be, as generous as you, be as generous as you possibly can, Quentin. Uh, Alex, I'm not optimistic. I'm not, I, I worry sometimes that, I am the, that we are the last generation that will know abide with me. Um, I worry that after us, after we've gone, nobody's ever going to open the Book of Common Prayer because, mm. and, and that the majesty of those words will be lost because the habit has fallen away, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, one thing I don't worry about, I don't worry about the rise of Islam because I think it's good that um, uh, Islamic people are worshipping and I think that the practice of worship is important yeah. and maybe that can be an example to us. So I don't, I don't worry about that, but I just worry about the laziness 
of so much of Britain when it comes to contemplating where we're going next. Yeah. And maybe the COVID thing, I mean, the church, are, the church, for instance, should be comfortable with the idea of death. So that was another reason that we should have been open. But um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, the church can help people to contemplate mortality a bit more and get away. I, my personal recipe for saving the church would be for the church to worry less about food banks, to worry less about global warming and to worry much more about the meaning of death and to try to communicate to people contemplation about where we go next. Mm, that's interesting. If I may just, just throw something in. Prior, prior to COVID, we didn't have a food bank at our church and we started one. And um, I've, I've found that as created some really interesting spiritual conversations with people well, you may be right. who use who have been using the food banks and and in the in the kind of the trauma of their life they've actually found some they still are holding on to something and, and for many of them it is a spiritual belief that's um, kind of and maybe maybe because they're old enough to be part of a generation where church was reasonably normal uh, or whilst not thriving um, well, that, that's heartening, and, and I, I confess, I, I admit, I may well be wrong on this, but I worry that a lot of the church's social outreach stuff feels like displacement activity for real contemplation and belief. Yeah. And th that's what worries me. When I go to church, I mean, one of our local vicars around here, I really feel that he believes, but that's quite rare, I must confess. And when I go to a service, uh, 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 I sometimes feel that I'm listening to somebody who's perhaps not themselves convinced. And that's not great if you're trying to convince others. No, no. Uh, I've been chatting with some of my clergy friends who I do think believe um, about, about the need for discipleship um, for actually believers. You know, uh, uh, I've asked people, I've, I asked a clergy friend of mine, why do you think people come to church? And he said, I've got no idea. I've got absolutely no idea why people come to church and, um, you know, I, I think in some cases it, well, I feel there should be a need for people to come to worship Christ more, um, but that's just a, a personal opinion. I just, I'm well, I think, I think yeah. habit, habit is really important. Habit is tremendously important because it, it, it puts you in a place where you're able somehow to start praying and, and, and believing. And if you've got into the habit, then it somehow makes that more likely to happen and if you just think about sometimes the beauty of certain moments in in the bible that moment for me in the day after christ has been crucified and mary comes to the garden and she sees christ and said rabboni that one moment because i remember my father saying that lesson and i can still hear his voice yeah. when i hear that word rabboni it really it really gets deep into me and i only can do that because i've had the habit of going to church as a child and yeah. hearing my father read the lesson, my late father. Yeah. And I can still hear his voice. And that sort of thing, it just, it, 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 it's a, a direct hit into your, yeah. into your liver. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Quentin. I'm just going to finish, Quentin, just on a pretty jovial topic. So it's, um, it's uh, we've got so much to worry about at the moment. We've got COVID, we've got Brexit. We've got Will Burnley survive in the Premier League and lots more. <laughs> no! <laughs> they will, trust me. <laughs> I support Hereford FC. We... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I shall pray for you, Quentin. <laughs> um, maybe a couple of, can you think of a couple of hymns maybe to send us on our way that for this time of um, difficulty for the nation that, that you think might just, uh, and I'll play them, I'll get them played in church on your recommendation. What, what? Well, if it's Lancashire, it has to be Hills of the North Rejoice, <laughs> surely. And yeah. um, uh, I remember as a boy going up to the hills around Lancaster, above Lancaster, where um, our school matron used to take me when I was a six year old, and those hills, my goodness, they were fantastic. Um, and the other one, the, the um, one church, one faith, one Lord, um, thy hand, O God, has guided. No, it, is, I, I'm trying to remember the, the start of the hymn. One church, one faith, one Lord is, is the, the refrain anyway. Yeah. Um, that's, and that, that's got the most tremendous verses. I can't remember any of them now, but um, it, it is a real rabble rouser. Yeah. <laughs> and it gets, uh, gets the congregation uh, waving their walking sticks in the air. <laughs> <laughs> 
lovely. What a great way to finish. Quentin, I, I had a feeling you'd be great, great to interview and it's been a real pleasure doing so. And I, I really appreciate your time and uh, I wish you well. I wish Hereford well. And, well, I wish Burnley uh, well, uh, Alex. And, um, yeah, uh, it's a lovely and, place. Have you ever been to Burnley, Quentin? Is it a place that you've... Um, I've been once on a general election campaign once ah. as a reporter in the back of a bus. But um, uh, uh, I, I know Lancashire a little bit from having from my youth, as I say, and yeah. also from party conferences going to Blackpool. I yeah. love Blackpool. I love Blackpool. I wish we went back to Blackpool all the time. Yeah. And I took my children to Blackpool two years ago, uh, one April for holiday, and they loved it too. Great. It is a, it's, it's a traditional, beautiful place with lots of trauma, but some wonderful things as yeah. well. So, yeah. yeah. Quentin, thank you so much. It's uh, really you, appreciated. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.